All right, I've got about 732. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Are you ready, Kyle? I am. Very good. All right, well, thank you all for being with us for our virtual State of the School address. Uh, pretty sure it's our first ever virtual State of the School address. Uh, it's funny to think back to this time last year and uh, things that we were talking about and planning on and, and I don't know, various things that we were having on our minds and maybe even worried about having no idea what was gonna be coming in a couple of months. But we're so pleased that you guys have made the effort to join us this evening. Uh, we really appreciate it. We hope that it'll be well worth your time. Uh, at the same time, uh, we hope not to, to drag this out too long. We'll make it somewhat brief, but at the same time, we wanna give sort of a comprehensive set of updates uh, as well as encouragements and uh, just things that are going to be pertinent for our families, for our faculty and community members uh, to know about as we go into 2021 and as we look ahead to the 2021-2022 school year. So uh, looking here at this first slide, we'll see if it's gonna work for me. There we go. Um, kind of give you the agenda for the evening. So I'm gonna start off by giving some introductions and an opening prayer. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about our operations, talk a bit about academics, and then I'll hand it over to Kyle who will talk to you guys about student life, advancement and enrollment. And then I'll give a couple of very brief closing remarks and then we are gonna open up for any questions that there might be. And so we kind of have the, the Zoom feature here so that it can be a little more interactive if there are questions you're coming into tonight with or if anything we're presenting tonight prompts questions. So again, if it's a question that you think will really warrant a long conversation, uh, we don't wanna have that long conversation here tonight, but we would love to schedule a time to meet with you. Uh, or if it's a question that really is just pertinent to maybe your situation, please send me an email and I'd be very happy to talk through that with you as well. But if it's a question that you know, we can you know, briefly kind of work through together, and uh, it's something that's pertinent to everyone who's here this evening. We would love to address that here and now. Uh, some questions we may not have an answer for you immediately, but uh, other ones hopefully we can give a good answer to right from the start. Uh, real quick before I start, uh, for our new families, really what tonight is, is it's our annual time where we ask all of the community to come together so that we can share all of the important updates, encouragements, uh, challenges and just really everything that's going on with us as a school. Um, as we're looking ahead to next school year, but really as we continue to see Providence grow, uh, not just in enrollment, but grow as uh, an institution. You know, I think continuing to grow in its quality of education that it's providing and Lord willing grow as an influence to young lives for many, many years to come. So uh, I'll do a couple of introductions and then I will open us up in some prayer. Usually uh, this would be the time where we, being in person, would be in the sanctuary and we would ask board members to stand up and raise their hands and we would bring faculty and staff members up to the front. Uh, this time we're not gonna ask faculty and board members or for you to try and find them and pick them out of the boxes. Uh, but if you do wanna put a face with a name, you can always go to our website and on our website, we have everyone's photo uh, along with their name and what their position is. Uh, including our board members as well. And so you can get on there and try and place names with faces. So first of all, uh, our board is made up of Dan Marcotte, who serves as our chairman, Carrie Stoner, who serves as our vice chairman, Tamara Weidler, who serves as secretary, Brett Vaden, Danny Simpson, and our newest board member, which we announced fairly recently, is Craig Ryder. And then of course, Kyle and myself serve on the board as ex officio members. So that is our board. And uh, just briefly to say, if, if you're wondering, well, what does the board do? Well, the board does uh, several things, but they're primarily a governing board, not so much an administrative board. Uh, the administration is of course delegated out to myself and to Kyle uh, in overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the school, as well as making uh, many of the decisions. The board is there uh, to, to govern, to oversee us, to hold us accountable, to take on certain uh, projects. One of the big things that the board has been doing the past year and a half has been serving as our main development people. So they do a lot of donor relations. 
uh, but they also do a lot to you know try and look ahead and um, for lack of a better term sort of predict what challenges are up ahead and uh, strategize how we can be ready for any of those challenges that may be coming. So they do a lot to advise Kyle and myself, uh, but they do more than I think I could take time to say tonight. So we're very thankful for our board members for the time that they volunteer, uh, not just every month at our meetings, but outside of those meetings, the many things that our board members have done over the years. So very, very thankful, of course, for our board members. <clears throat> our faculty and staff uh, as well, uh, I'll go through them. Many of you, of course, are familiar with all of our faculty and staff, but just to be sure, I'm gonna start kind of from the bottom, work our way up. We have Mrs. Kathleen Ackridge, who is serving as our pre-K teacher. We have Mrs. Heather Dernlin, who is our kindergarten teacher. Mrs. Colette Upton, first grade teacher. Mrs. Patricia Horton, who is our second grade teacher. Mrs. Jackie Gathman, who is our third grade teacher. And then to highlight this one, we've had a transition in fourth grade here at semester. We have Miss Emma Buniak, who is our fourth grade teacher. Uh, Mr. Stoll transitioned out at the end of last semester. He has uh, accepted a position over at Westminster. Uh, we're very thankful for the time that he served, but we're also very, very thankful uh, that Emma Buniak is joining us here and she's just finished up her second day with us even today. And then Mrs. Kim Sparks is our fifth grade teacher. She primarily uh, teaches the fifth grade classes. She also serves as our grammar school liaison. And then our sixth grade teacher is Mrs. Bethany Chelsvik. And then we have a couple of other teachers teaching in sixth grade. We have Mrs. Stephanie Bliss who teaches mathematics, Mr. Stuart Dace who teaches science. And then uh, I also wanted to mention that Mr. Duvier, who's one of our upper school teachers has been teaching fifth grade composition this year. And then our co-curricular teachers in the grammar school as well as in the upper school, truly, uh, we have Mrs. Krista Ryder teaching our music classes, Mrs. Lindsay Block teaching our grammar Latin classes, Mrs. Katie Scogan teaching our physical education classes, and Mrs. Kimberly Doyle teaching our art classes. Then in the upper school, we have Mrs. Kareen Zrodlowski, who teaches seventh, eighth, and 10th grade math, as well as 10th and 11th grade science. We have Mrs. Lindsay Block, in addition to teaching grammar school Latin, teaching our seventh grade literature class. We have Mr. Duvier, in addition to teaching fifth grade composition, he also teaches seventh, eighth, uh, seventh and eighth grade composition and ninth grade rhetoric. So he is reading a lot of student essays this year. And so continue to keep him in your prayers as he teaches our students well how to write, but we're so thankful for him offering his gifts. He also teaches 10th grade literature. Mr. Stuart Dace teaches 7th, 8th, 9th, and 12th grade science. Mr. Pete Watson teaches 7th and 8th grade Bible, 7th and 8th grade history, and 9th and 10th grade theology. I uh, myself teach the 8th grade logic class. Mrs. Bethany Chelsvik, in addition to teaching 6th grade, teaches 8th grade literature. Mr. Andrew Block teaches our seventh through 10th grade Latin, as well as our 11th grade Greek. Mrs. Stephanie Bliss teaches, in addition to sixth grade math, ninth, 11th, and 12th grade math classes. Mr. Kyle Keating, our dean, in addition to serving as dean, serves uh, to teach the 11th and 12th grade history class, as well as the 12th grade theology class. Ms. Rachel Brewer, teaches 10th grade history, 11th and 12th grade rhetoric, and 11th and 12th grade literature. Mr. Jonathan Matul teaches 10th grade rhetoric and 11th grade theology. Mrs. Krista Ryder, in addition to teaching grammar school music, conducts our 9th through 12th grade choir. Mrs. Kimberly Doyle also teaches 7th through 10th grade art in addition to grammar school art. And Mrs. Katie Scogan, in addition to teaching grammar school PE, teaches the 7th through 10th grade. PE classes. And then other staff and administration, I serve as our headmaster. Mr. Kyle Keating serves as our dean. We also have Mrs. Katie Scogan, in addition to her physical education classes, she serves as our director of athletics. We have Mrs. Pam Case serving as our administrative assistant. This is Jenny Matul serving as part time receptionist and enrollment coordinator. And Mrs. Linda Vastola serving as our bookkeeper. So we're very thankful, uh, of course, the lifeblood of the school is our teachers, our faculty, and our staff. They are the ones who continue to pour into our students' lives day after day. 
So we couldn't thank them enough for all of their service. Continue to keep us as an administration and as a board, as well as all of our faculty and our other staff members in prayer as we not only navigate through this year, but really if we could say all circumstances were normal and as they usually are, we would still very much need and covet your prayers. Uh, because when we consider Providence's mission and vision as a school, uh, as I think I mentioned in my most recent uh, from the desk of the headmaster, uh, it's something that we cannot accomplish in our own strength. What we're trying to see happen in the students' lives is going to take an act of divine intervention. And that's something I have to continually remind myself of, which is a good and humbling thing uh, to see that even those of us who are parents seeking to raise our children, uh, we know that much of what we can try to do is create the right conditions, present to them uh, true, good, and beautiful things. Uh, but at the same time, if you want to see love cultivated, if you want to see transformation happen in a student, uh, that takes uh, work of the Holy Spirit. So speaking of prayer, I'm going to open us in a word of prayer after those introductions, and then we will get down to the business side of things. So let's pray. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so humbled when we think of this great privilege that we have to serve at a school like Providence. It is such an important calling to raise up students for lives of wisdom and virtue and eloquence to your glory. So we pray, God, that you would be ever present in our daily labors. Lord, we praise you for your many mercies to us over the first semester and over this past year of 2020 as it was full of unique challenges. And as we know, even in this past year, we have fallen short of your perfect standard. We're ever reminded of our frailty and the fallen nature of man in these times. We look to you for our strength. Lord, we look to you for our wisdom. We look to you for all of our provision. Thank you for sustaining us, providing us the blessing of your son, the opportunity to educate students in the light of your truth. And Lord, we pray that you would make this time tonight fruitful to your praise. May it be a blessed time of connection between the administration and the community amidst a time of such separation. We pray, Lord, for your blessing over this semester, over this coming year, and for the many years, Lord, that we pray Providence would continue to serve the families who enroll and serve our communities nearby and be even a regional influence uh, to see uh, a transformation in the lives of students that they themselves, Lord, be a light in the darkness. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. So as we continue, I'm gonna begin with operations. So just give you a bit of an overview, I'm gonna highlight some things. So first, uh, considering kind of our budget and finances, the good news is uh, our budget is balanced, cash flow is good, and we are well positioned to grow in our stability hopefully as well in uh, getting a more competitive, competitive faculty salary and enhancing our programs. I think what's important to emphasize about our financial stability at this time is we came out of 2020, which is a very uncertain and unstable year. Uh, and when the pandemic hit and when things shut down, there were questions about the economic impact. Uh, we're thankful to say that, that Providence was well provided for through that time. Uh, and so coming out of 2020 with as balanced a budget as we have, uh, being very secure and stable for uh, not only the future, but for growth in the future uh, is a great encouragement. So uh, I'm glad to report that. I know we don't really give a whole lot of financial reports out. We're starting to do that more in our board meetings. Uh, and so we hope to continue to keep all of you up to date on how Providence continues to do financially. What's related to uh, the finance overview is our kind of enrollment and fundraising goals for next year. So our fundraising goal uh, each year uh, is set actually to help us meet our budget. So our tuition doesn't actually cover all of our expenses for a year. Our tuition covers typically about 85%, I would say, of our expenses for a year. So we cover that other 15% with fundraising. And so, of course, the most uh, obvious fundraising is March and Serve in the Park, but I also mentioned how our board members do very much behind the scenes in talking to donors and other friends of Providence that some for many years have continued to be very generous with the school. Uh, some are only new to us uh, and coming, providing all kinds of gifts and support to the school. 
So uh, our fundraising goal uh, this year is $126,000. And Kyle will talk a little bit more later about kind of where we are in terms of meeting that goal and some of our strategies in meeting that goal. But as it relates to the budget, uh, the reason that's so high is because our enrollment is where it is. And so what one of our main goals is, is to see our enrollment get to about 130 or 140. If we can get to 130 or 140, then we would be in such a stable place that tuition would actually cover all of our expenses and fundraising would truly be going towards advancement. Uh, and again, as will be mentioned, I think a little bit later, our enrollment goal for next year is to get up to 120. We're presently at 111. Uh, and so we don't think 120 is an overly ambitious goal. But one thing that we are considering is that we have a fairly large senior class that will be graduating this year, uh, large relative to us, that is, uh, nine students. And so it's a given that those nine students will be transitioning out of the school and going on to the next stage. So we won't just be going from 111 to 120. We're seeking to go from about 102 to 120. But uh, the Lord has been so good this past year. We're so thankful for our new families that are with us uh, and also really thankful for the good reports that we've heard from them, that they're very happy and satisfied with their experience here so far. I think the last thing I want to say about enrollment is, again, 120 may not seem like a super ambitious goal, but part of what we're trying to do is to see gradual and healthy growth in the school. That we don't just want to grow our numbers, but we want to see that every family who joins Providence is value added. Each one of you knows our admissions process. We have the board interview, we have the pastor recommendation, we have the academic assessment, and going through all of that just to really see that every family is a good fit, that they're going to be a good fit for us, and that we're going to be a good fit for them. Uh, we want to be absolutely sure of that before we uh, commit to that going forward. And so we've been so pleased with the families who have joined us this past year, because each one of you is so much more than just kind of a, a number or ticking the box, but you guys have added so much to our community and to our culture. Uh, and that's what we're looking for, not just raising those numbers, but for that real healthy value added growth of families. So then tuition updates. I'm not gonna to talk too much here because we have released uh, tuition numbers a month or so ago, actually. Uh, I think it was December 8th. So it'll be a month this coming Friday. And so we released those, uh, of course, pre-K three is going to be $3,000 for the year long tuition next year. Pre-K four will be 4,000. Kindergarten will be 5,950. Grammar school, 8,890. And upper school, 10,850. One of the other things that we put out with tuition this year was showed a monthly breakdown so that if you were curious, because I think a lot of families, you know, that's how you budget. Uh, very few of you are paying that one lump sum. A lot of you are paying it in installments. And so we tried to present that in a, a more convenient format for you this year so that you can get an idea and wrap your mind around how that works with your monthly budget. We also want to encourage families who have yet to re-enroll uh, that this Friday is the last day that you'll be able to re-enroll for an enrollment fee of only $10. After this Friday, it is going to go from $10, I believe, up to $100 per student. So if you haven't re-enrolled yet and you know that you are going to be re-enrolling for next year, make sure you take care of that in the next few days and take care, uh, or take advantage of that lower re-enrollment fee. If anyone is on the fence or uncertain about re-enrolling for next year, if you have questions that we can talk through with you, we would really like to have that conversation uh, to, to hear about what your hesitations may be and see if there are ways that we can answer them. Uh, so we, of course, always welcome and encourage that. Uh, I also want to mention, of course, related to tuition uh, is indexed tuition. This was our first year having our indexed tuition program. And so indexed tuition, I would say, has been very successful, allowing families who otherwise certainly couldn't have afforded our school to attend Providence this year. But that, of course, does mean we are trying to increase our fundraising efforts and increase our enrollment to offset the dollars that uh, are not otherwise coming in because of tuition adjustments with the index tuition. And so um, you'll see also with next year's tuition, index tuition and that whole program remains exactly the same. And so the salary brackets for household income are the same as well as those percentage breaks. Uh, of course, the only difference is going to be that uh, since the baseline tuition has risen, those indexes will have risen slightly as well. Uh, but tuition went up across the board just about 3%. Um, one other thing that I think is important to note is many of the fees that you used to have to pay 
have now been rolled into tuition. And so we did raise tuition just incrementally more than 3%. Uh, because next year you won't be paying uh, many of the fees that you've had to pay before uh, with facts and so forth for different services. Uh, since all of those fees were uh, just kind of already written into what everyone was paying to try and make it cleaner and clearer and more upfront what you will be paying, uh, we are going to be absorbing the fees as a school and paying for that with uh, the increased tuition dollars. Um, for those of you who are in an index tuition this year, and if you're wondering what your index tuition is gonna look like next year, really the rule of thumb is if your financial situation uh, has very much remained the same, then you can expect the same uh, sort of percentage index tuition as you would have received this year. However, if your financial situation does change, whether you know it goes up or if it goes down, uh, index, your indexed application will assess that and it will be adjusted accordingly. Uh, but if anyone ever has any questions about index tuition, I'm happy to uh, speak to those. It's still a fairly new program. Uh, we certainly saw some bugs in it last year, but we think we've corrected those for this year. So hopefully it's just a smoother and more pleasant process uh, this year than it was even last year. Uh, facilities update. So I'm sure there are questions over the past few years. We have uh, done a few different things. Uh, several years back, we had a facility search committee going out and looking for possible places uh, and that committee had changed shape over time and even uh, in the past year we've had a, a committee of different members looking around and looking for places. Um, and to give a little bit of background of course some of the reasons why we've been uh, looking outward for facilities is uh, a uh, we want to make sure that we've always got room for growth uh, but b you know in the long-term kind of vision I think of the school uh, we see ourselves, you know, having our own facility at some point. Now, nothing to say that we have not been tremendously happy with Wellspring. They have been such a great host, uh, and we expect that we will continue to be with Wellspring for some time, which I'll, I'll get to here in just a minute, uh, at least for the next couple of years. Um, uh, it has nothing to do with uh, dissatisfaction with the church or with their caring for us as tenants. Uh, that has just been one of the richest blessings I think the school can testify to. Uh, but when we continue to think of really the long, long-term plans of the school, kind of the 10, 15, 20 year goals that we have, uh, a new facility and a facility that uh, will, will better boost what the school is doing, uh, is something we just always wanna keep our eyes open for. Now, to be honest, of course, this past year that has stalled very much. Uh, because when we were all, you know, going into lockdown last spring and even through the summer, getting into this school year with all of the pandemic response procedures and contingencies, uh, the board and the administration has had their hands very, very full uh, in just getting through this year. But the other thing is we learned uh, before the pandemic hit that we want to see the school in a much more stable position. Uh, we want to continue to see enrollment going up. We want to make sure that uh, our finances are where we want them to be. And so get closer to that 130, 140 enrollment point uh, before we would see ourselves transition into another space. So with that, we continue to be in conversation with Wellspring, uh, the church that hosts us. Uh, they've been very open with us about their own uh, you know, considerations for either sprucing up the current building or moving to a different building or constructing another building or something like that. Uh, they, they continue to think through the options themselves for their church, uh, but they continue to be open and transparent with us as we are with them, uh, because if they should find a facility that would continue to house us well uh, and is going to be a good move for them, uh, they would like for us to continue to work with them uh, in the way that we have been in our kind of uh, tenant leasey relationship. So uh, that's encouraging. It's good to know that Wellspring is very much on our side and we're very much on their side. And if there is an option in the future that works really well for both institutions to continue uh, residing in the same building, uh, we continue to be open to that. Uh, but likewise, if the church finds a place that uh, they think is just perfect for the church, but there's not room for us, uh, then we you know, continue to keep our eyes open for where we would go. Likewise, um, we continue to keep our eyes open if there's a facility that's great for us, but maybe it's not so great for Wellspring. So everything's kind of on the table right now. But at the same time, uh, what I want to give you is the security that we and Wellspring don't necessarily see ourselves going away from this building in the next couple of years. Uh, and so as we continue to keep things on the table and have discussions, uh, 
don't expect to have a sudden surprise. Oh, wow, we're moving all of a sudden. Uh, you will see it coming from miles and miles away is what our plan would be uh, so that we can give you plenty of notice, plenty of heads up. Uh, but as of next year and probably the next school year we're looking at too, we will continue to be in this facility uh, partnering with Wellspring and sharing the building. And uh, we're very, very thankful for that as they continue to consider their future plans since their merger about this time last year. And as we continue to uh, see Providence come out of you know, this uh, initial stage of the pandemic and really look ahead to the future. So if you ever have questions or if you're ever uh, concerned or if you're feeling anxious because you're wondering about the building, please, please email me. Or if you're concerned or anxious about anything else, uh, please email me. Uh, I think one of the things I realize is uh, there are a lot of things I'm privy to. I think Kyle and I and the board have realized this. We're privy to many things that a lot in our community aren't necessarily as up to date on. And so if you just want a quick brief update because it's something you're curious about or concerned about, please reach out. And typically there's a pretty easy and quick answer that I can give you that can hopefully calm any fears that you might have. So that's the facility update uh, for now, uh, which really the update is there is no update at this time as we continue to, to look ahead to the future and really kind of focus on doing the best uh, that we can and like I said, continue to stabilize this year and look ahead to next year. So uh, the last thing I'm gonna talk about with operations is the pandemic, of course. Um, and this is really kind of the only place where we'll spend some time talking about this, but uh, we've gotten through our first semester and that first semester, of course, has had some challenges. It's had a few positive cases here or there, uh, a couple of classes going into quarantine at various points or families. Uh, I myself, of course, right now am observing a uh, quarantine. And we're thankful to see that a lot of those protocols have been very effective. We have never seen a widespread community transmission in our school at any point. Uh, and so we're very thankful for that, to see that these protocols remain effective. At no point have we had to do sort of a mass shutdown of the school. Uh, and I think it's safe to say as we go into this coming semester, things hopefully as the weather continues to warm up once again, as we get closer to the summer, things will just continue to loosen and get even easier. Uh, I think the winter was the, the main thing we were wondering, waiting and seeing how things were going to play out. Uh, and I, I'm hopeful that, you know, sort of the, the worst is even behind us. And so I hope I'm not being too much of an optimist in saying that. But uh, really, I've also learned this past year not to... Uh, count our eggs before they hatch. <laughs> and so as we were getting into uh, the second semester last year, who knew uh, what was right around the corner? Uh, but likewise, uh, you know, as we get into this semester, we're ready for anything. I think that's something Kyle and I learned this past year, our first full year as being the, the, the two-person administrative team. Uh, after getting through this past year, we feel pretty comfortable that uh, whatever pivots need to be made in the future, uh, we'll be ready for them. So continue to give us your prayers though. We need the Lord's wisdom and we need the Lord's mercy and grace throughout all of it. So uh, pandemic plan uh, reminders and so forth. Um, there, I put on there pandemic plan updates. As of now, there are no revisions uh, or updates there. Uh, as some of you know, the CDC has released some updated information, but we continue to look to St. Louis County's protocols. I continue to confer with the Christian School Association of St. Louis, uh, and uh, we continue to collaborate on how to set up proper protocols. And so as of right now, uh, there are no changes that you necessarily need to be aware of. Uh, and so as we go into this semester, as we've already finished the second day of the semester, um, really, I just wanted to give some reminders, uh, I think. And so <clears throat> let me see. Yeah, so first, by way of reminders, um, every morning we have those screening questions, and we want to make sure that every family takes time to fill out those screening questions, because on the one hand, uh, it's giving the school some assurance, but at the same time, it's prompting you to think through some things. Uh, really, it's, it's there uh, to prompt you to consider, are there any concerning symptoms or interactions or anything that make me think I might want to contact the school just to double check and see, is, there, is this something of a level of concern that so-and-so should stay home? 
or are we good to go forward? And we would just say, when in doubt, call the school, email the school. Um, if it's not too inconvenient, really just to, to, to keep your child home, even for the first part of the morning until we're able to talk so that we can kind of figure out if it's uh, the right thing or if it's not. Because on the one hand, you know, in observing our protocols, we've been able to prevent uh, spread or exposure. Uh, on the other hand, uh, at points where if those protocols aren't followed, sometimes there are exposures that didn't necessarily need to happen. And so we wanna continue to try to, to care well for each other and to protect each other uh, from the virus, but also from exposure to the virus because uh, even just exposure can do much to disrupt uh, the lives of a family. So again, if you have any concerning symptoms, if you have any questions when you're filling out those questions in the morning, we uh, just ask that you call the school, check in real quick to see, hey, is this going to be okay? Or, or do we need to take some kind of action? Or should we just keep them home for the day just precautionarily? Uh, we really appreciate, we know it's very inconvenient at those times when families have done that, but we really appreciate times where families have exercised that caution on behalf of the other families in the school. Uh, the other, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, thing I want to refresh on is we have that morning drop-off and afternoon pickup lane. Uh, and so if you haven't been using that, we wanna continue to encourage families to use that. However, uh, you know, if you have a pre-K student or, or even a kindergarten student that it's just better to escort them to their classroom, or if you need to come into the building on a given morning or afternoon for a particular reason to drop by the office or to talk to a teacher, anyone of course is welcome to come in for those occasions. Uh, all we want to really do is to default to going to the pickup drop off lane, just to you know, uh, minimize all of the traffic through the building during those times of day, especially. Uh, and so we'll continue to have those lanes running and we wanna make sure that uh, we're, we're channeling folks over to that. Uh, so then the last piece on here, family care, uh, I think I just want to remind, I was thinking back to the last spring and when we first went kind of under lockdown, something that was brought very much to my attention was, uh, you know, how I wanted to make sure I was encouraging families to stay connected. Uh, you know, I think even though that initial stage of the pandemic is behind us and things are a bit different now than they were in March, April, May, um, I think it's still important for families to find opportunities to connect with one another, uh, whether that's virtually or in person, uh, you know, trying to observe certain measures and, and safety precautions. Uh, but I, I think it's important just to acknowledge that as we've gotten this deep into the pandemic, to be reminded that we are still kind of in the middle of this pandemic. So make sure that you're caring well for yourselves, make sure you're caring well for your families, and reaching out to other families and asking how they're doing, uh, you know, saying, hey, you know, just wanted to check in. I mean, even if there's nothing to prompt you to believe that there's anything that would be wrong, uh, it's just good to check in because uh, you never know, you know, what family may be particularly struggling. You know, they may not even be in quarantine or have had any exposures or anything like that. Nevertheless, our lives and our world has been radically changed this past year and uh, people might be struggling in ways uh, that you may not have imagined. So uh, I just want to continue to remind our families, <coughs> excuse me, to do this, to look out for one another and to care well for yourselves. Uh, I think it's important to continue thinking about how to play the long game in this, that we've seen that this is really not so much of a sprint uh, in making our way through these circumstances, uh, but they continue to remain somewhat indefinite. So we will see as we continue to go forward. Uh, and then finally, again, continue to pray for the school, pray for the administration, the faculty, the staff, the students, and the other families, uh, as there's all kinds of uh, challenges and obstacles that we all face each day, whether they be physical obstacles or uh, spiritual or emotional or relational. Uh, I think, honestly, the work that the school is seeking to do uh, is a work that uh, the enemy seeks to thwart. And so we very much need uh, all of the prayer support to see that our teachers are uh, able to stand strong amidst all of the, the various discouragements that come up as a teacher, all of the, the wearisome tasks that can come up in the day-to-day -day work. Uh, teaching is a, is a challenging job, and we're so thankful that each and every one of our teachers has such a heart for the students. Really, that's the only way that you can continue to, to persevere through such a uh, difficult day-to-day um, -day labor. But I'm thankful to say that all of our teachers do it with a smile on their face and with great satisfaction at the end of the day, knowing that 
they're touching a day that they will never see, uh, that the investments that they're making now, we pray, uh, will bear fruit to eternity. All right, so to academics, uh, this will be a little bit shorter than the operations, but uh, in academics, uh, pre-K, uh, we've kind of put out there, but I just want to clarify, uh, again, a little bit of background. Our pre-K program started a couple of years ago, um, and it was a three-day-a-week program for four-year-old students, and uh, it was a very successful year. We were so happy with everything that the program produced. The year following that, which was last school year, uh, we did not have uh, hardly any enrollment for pre-K, and so we had to put the program to rest for a year, and we reconsidered it and rethought it, and this year we offered it as a three-day-a-week with an option of doing two days a week, three and four-year-old class. So it is presently this year been operating Monday, Wednesday, Fridays with a combination of three and four-year-old students. Some students attend all three days, some students just attend two days. Uh, as we look ahead to next year, now uh, we've just drummed up a lot of interest, it seems, in the pre-K program. We've reached our max capacity this year, uh, astonishingly, quite quickly, and we already have a lot of interest in the program for next year. We are actually separating it into two distinct classes now. So pre-K four will be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three days a week, and that's for four-year-olds. And pre-K three will be on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and that will be for three-year-olds. Uh, and Mrs. Ackridge will continue to be our teacher for both of those classes. And uh, that is the, uh, the change in pre-K for next year. So instead of being a combined class with three and four-year-olds, we're gonna have a four-year-old class that's going three days a week and a three-year-old class that's going two days a week. Uh, and we're, we're pretty sure that we're going to see a good bit of enrollment for both of those classes, which uh, we're excited about and thankful for. It's been a joy to have pre-K back in the building this year. Uh, they bring a different kind of energy and a different kind of enthusiasm uh, that just really inspires all of us, I think. So then the academic catalog, uh, I've mentioned this, I think the past couple of years, uh, it's a project that I started working on when I was uh, promoted to the director of academics a few years ago and continued to work on up until this past summer when I actually passed the project along to one of our upper school teachers, Ms. Brewer. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's a project that has been a collaboration by all of the faculty over these past couple of years. But the idea is that the academic catalog will be a full outlining of all of our academic courses from pre-K up through 12th grade. Uh, that is intended to be a resource for faculty. It's a resource for families. It's a resource for other classical Christian schools that we are in contact with, that we collaborate with from other parts of the nation. Uh, and so we hope that that resource uh, will be very useful to us. We're very excited to see it uh, come to completion soon, hopefully. Uh, and so we've made a lot of good progress on it this year, and it looks like it should be on track to be available and ready for us by the next school year. Uh, and so as we get to the end of this coming summer, uh, we're looking forward to sharing that. Uh, teacher professional development. And so I've listed it there as teacher discussions in the great tradition. Uh, so we continue to do professional development. We have our regular professional development program with our teachers, which is kind of a one-on-one -on -one coaching program where we have teachers observing other teachers, uh, giving feedback, receiving feedback, administrators observing teachers, that that goes on year to year, and that's just our regular program. But in addition to that, we have uh, professional development that we do in the mornings together before school starts. And we've been doing this this year on Thursday mornings about every other week. And we've been reading through a book called The Great Tradition, which is a collection of classical writings on what it means to be an educated human being. And it's full of all kinds of rich material. And we have just loved reading through various excerpts, having conversations as a faculty, and continuing to set our sights and our minds and elevate them up to these grand ideas that we aspire to as a classical Christian school, which I think is especially important now when we have all these distractions, when we can be tempted to just kind of get into survival mode in the middle of what we're doing now and lose sight of continuing to look up and higher at all of these great things and great truths and uh, the, the, the beauty of these writings. And, um, uh, and I guess not just the beauty of the writings, but uh, the, the glory of the great ideas that we want students to encounter, uh, the virtues that we want them to emulate 
And so uh, really these discussions have served to inspire our faculty to see that they're not just drudgingly surviving through each day, but continuing to aspire to our vision as a classical Christian school. The final thing I want to mention in academics, and then I'll pass it on to Kyle uh, for the next couple of things, is some language program developments. Uh, I think I mentioned at last year's State of the School that we had been uh, sort of evaluating our language program, specifically talking about uh, our Latin and Greek language courses, which traditionally have run from fourth grade through 10th grade being Latin, and then 11th grade being Greek, and 12th grade uh, being a Greek elective year. Uh, and so in having conversations the past year and a half with faculty as we've been trying to consider what are the strengths and the merits of our current language program, what are the areas for improvement, uh, we have a couple of changes, a couple of things that we will be integrating next year for our Latin program. Uh, what will not be changing is we'll continue to be offering the same Latin for fourth through 10th grade that we have been uh, over the past uh, couple of years. We made a couple of slight changes to some curriculum this year, which we've seen a lot of good things, a lot of fruit. Thank you very much to Lindsay Block and Andrew Block, who are our Latin teachers. Um, and, and those have been really good changes in starting to prepare students for being able to read great works in their original Latin languages. Um, but what we're gonna be changing next year, the main thing is we want to continue aspiring to make Latin a more uh, central and celebrated part of our school's culture. A big part about being a classical Christian school is getting acquainted with the Latin language. Uh, and there's all kinds of benefits to why we learn Latin. It's one of the things you know, that probably people notice at the outset when they're looking at a school like ours is, oh, wow, you guys learn Latin. Uh, I heard people don't really speak that anymore. Well, some of the other merits that we're getting into is, uh, first of all, so many of the great books of antiquity, so many of the great books of the Western heritage were written in Latin. And we would love to see students engage with that, but also knowing how much language is intertwined with culture and how when you are beginning to get acquainted with a language, you are actually entering into that culture in a much different way. So if we're really trying to delve into the ancient and the medieval thinkers, uh, and even the Reformation thinkers, to see how that culture is encapsulated into that Latin language. Likewise, learning Latin has all kinds of other benefits in giving perspective on the English language. Uh, you learn a system of language from a totally different perspective, a language that operates much differently than English operates, but by contrasting and comparing those two languages, you understand much more about grammar and syntax. So uh, we continue to prize Latin, but we think that it can become an even more central and celebrated feature of the school. So one of the other things we're gonna to do to try and do that is we're actually gonna start introducing Latin at an earlier stage next year. Uh, we would like to start introducing Latin as early as second and third grade. Uh, and so we're still working out all of the details of how that would happen. And it would be much more minimal than the kind of intensive Latin that the fourth grade starts getting into. But we want to start introducing Latin instruction and study in those earlier grades, and even start having sort of different Latin phrases and exchanges, uh, like rather than a student raising their hand asking if they can use the restroom in English, raising their hand and asking that in Latin, or the teacher telling the students to line up in the Latin language uh, and uh, continuing to play with that and get students to delight in that language from those early years. So then when they go on to study it in the later years, they're already somewhat familiar with it and have already grown to have an affection for it. The last thing uh, that we are gonna change, and this is probably the more uh, groundbreaking change, is in the 11th and 12th grade years, we would like to extend Latin beyond 10th grade into 11th and 12th grade. Uh, and so the question is, so, so what about Greek? Are they gonna learn Latin and Greek? At this time, we are just going to centralize our focus on to Latin because what we found is when they get to the end of the 10th grade year, they've finally just kind of gotten to the point that they can start picking up works in the Latin language and start to read them and enjoy them and delight in them and, and really kind of experience what we've been aspiring to with that language uh, throughout. So uh, the difficult thing is Greek continues to be a prized language in our school as well. And if I'm being perfectly honest, what my hope is, is that someday as the school continues to grow and as our, our resources continue to expand, 
we can offer Greek once again as an elective. And so once they get to that 11th grade year, they can choose whether they will go on to continue Latin or shift over to Greek. Uh, but for now, where our resources are as they are, we can only offer one language in those 11th and 12th grade years. And we would like to shift that language from being Greek over to being Latin, uh, rather than getting them right to the point where they're ready to truly start sinking their teeth into Latin, shifting to an entirely different language, uh, we want to let them continue expanding on Latin in 11th grade and then potentially electing to uh, delve into it further into the 12th grade. So those are the academic updates. Uh, really, you know, it's, it's change of shape in pre-K. Here's what's going on with the academic catalog and then our professional development. The Latin change is probably the biggest change uh, but we continue to look at other areas of our curriculum and we will continue to provide updates as we find uh, needed changes arise. Uh, but these are slow processes. We never want to make quick changes. And even with the Latin change, it's gonna be incremental over the coming years. Uh, it's not gonna be just a complete flip on anybody. But I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to Kyle. I've done plenty of talking for now and uh, I'll let him take us into student life. Thank you, Mr. Buckles. Um, it's great to be with you all this evening. Um, and before <clears throat> I dive into student life, I want to make two brief comments. Uh, one, if you think about uh, a year ago around today when we would have had state of the school, we were talking about uh, a brand new administrative change and uh, we were uh, operating on an enrollment of uh, 94 students and figuring out how to balance the budget and, uh, and little did we know what the rest of 2020 would have in store for us. And so the, the one thing I wanted to share with you all is um, I'm the person who gets to work with Mr. Buckles the most cl closely over the course of uh, the year. And, and I just can't tell you how uh, impressed and grateful I am to serve underneath him as headmaster. I think he's uh, done a fabulous job this first year. So just to, you know, to give you some perspective from within the administration, I think you all have seen that um, from your own vantage points as well. Um, but just from my own, my own perspective, um, I've been so deeply encouraged um, by how this past year has gone despite the, the various obstacles and transitions. Um, I mean, if you'd written them down on a sheet of paper at the start of the year, uh, you know, they would have felt uh, overwhelming and, uh, and maybe they were at times, but um, yeah, I've just been, been really encouraged by both uh, uh, Mr. Buckle's work and, and really how the Lord has sustained us over the course of the year. Uh, my second other comment is you'll notice that I am without a, 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 a nice shirt and tie. That's because this morning when I packed my car, I remembered to pack my really large fire pit um, for play week, uh, but forgot to pack a, a nice shirt and tie for state of the school. So I'm sporting the, uh, the, the Providence sweatshirt for state of the school, not quite up to our normal uh, uniform stuff, but I'll plea, uh, plea play week and pandemic and, and such things. Um, so with those things out of the way, I wanna talk some student life stuff, uh, very briefly, really just highlighting some things that have been going on that we've sort of already flagged for you, but just to give you updates on how they're going. Uh, at the start of this year, we talked about adjusting how we do recess and lunch monitoring. That came out of uh, a number of concerns from various families saying, hey, we, we have this school culture that we're really trying to cultivate. Um, and then when it comes to recess and lunch monitoring, it, it feels like it's really hard to sustain that during those times um, because there's, there's a lot of freedom and they're just less structured times. And so we lose some of the, the things that we value as a school. And we've we heard a number of families express those sort of concerns. And so the adjustment that we sought to make this year was to have uh, either Mr. Buckles or myself out there for every recess. Um, one that just gives us greater consistency as we're seeking to set expectations and navigate conflict and uh, deal with all the, the, the normal things that we see um, on a playground and, and try and find the right balance between really giving students freedom in those less structured times while also retaining um, the kind of expectations that we have for uh, their conduct and behavior. And I think both Mr. Buckles and I have felt that it's been really beneficial, even aside from the monitoring recess piece of it. Um, it's been a really big blessing for us because we've gotten to, to know the grammar school students uh, really well over the course of the semester uh, in ways that we wouldn't have because we don't 
teach regular classes in the grammar school. And so it's let us get to know each of your kids, each of their, their personalities, some of their quirks, um, and really all of the, the things that make them wonderful. And so uh, we've, we've gotten the opportunity to do that and have found that to be really beneficial. Um, there are probably still some more tweaks and adjustments that we'll look to make on recess monitoring as we go forward. Um, but this was sort of the first incremental change on that part to have an administrator out there each day. We would love it to have an administrator paired with a parent. We know that's a really hard time of uh, day for parents to volunteer, but if you are available, there is always a need for parents who are willing to step in and, and help with recess monitoring. Um, if you are interested, available, I know you've heard this plea before, um, but I'm making it again. Uh, email uh, Mrs. Case at, at, the, at her email at office at Providence STL. And then lunch monitoring, we've, due to pandemic, had lunches in classrooms, um, and that's been a trade-off. Obviously, our students spend lots of time in their classrooms, and we wish that they could have lunch elsewhere. At the same time, we feel like it's been beneficial for our students to have um, that time structure somewhat structured or at least uh, guided by their classroom teachers as well. So that's recess and lunch monitoring. Uh, the second thing you'll see there is the Providence Book of Prayer. And then you see to the to the right there an image, which is actually the cover of uh, the this year's Book of Prayer. This is uh, essentially a compilation of prayers, uh, psalms, and hymns that we use each morning to open our day. Um, now, that's something that we've done before this year, historically, but one of the things that that, uh, that I sought to do this year in working with Mrs. Ryder to really compile this edition of the Book of Prayer was to have one uh, more uh, sort of uh, liturgical or formal prayers that we are praying with consistency so that even as we're separated in our different classrooms, uh, we're still sort of praying together as we say uh, shared prayers together that are drawn from um, the rich tradition of, of uh, Christian worship. And uh, so that that's one piece. We sing a psalm each morning and uh, or a hymn each morning and recite a psalm and we kind of work our way through a selection of psalms uh that the that we sort of set aside as a school to say hey we want to we want to memorize these so that as, as our students make their way from pre-k all the way up uh to their senior year they have this collection of psalms that they have memorized um, that really speak to the whole experience of uh walking with god and so uh yeah the, the Providence Book of Prayer, if you want to actually see what's in it, uh, it's posted in the app under the resources button. Uh, you can go there and kind of page through the digital version of that Book of Prayer and see the kind of things that are there. We started incorporating or adding a couple Latin versions of prayers in there this year uh, with hopes of sort of implementing that a little bit more um, in, our, in our sort of regular school life in the future. Our buddy system is uh, a big part of what makes it great to have pre-K through 12 under one roof. Um, and of course, with the pandemic and uh, cohorts and all of that, that's meant that uh, we haven't been able to do the buddy system in its normal traditional sense with all school assemblies and things like that. Um, but in lieu of that, we have done pen pal buddies. And so uh, buddies have been writing notes to and from one another over the course of the year. Um, and uh, around Christmas time, I saw a lot of uh, the, the office has basically become a uh, pseudo post office for messages passed between grammar and upper school buddies. And around Christmas time, there were a lot of uh, candy and gifts that were left on the, the desk. And I kept going by thinking maybe it's for me, but no, it was it was for a grammar school or upper school buddy. Um, so so it seems like our students are really embracing the, the pen pal nature of the, the buddy system, even though it's not exactly the way it normally is. And of course, we look forward to when we can return to its sort of normal uh, way of functioning. The last thing I'll note, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the year, that the upper school house system is on hiatus this year as we seek to do uh, revisions. Uh, really early on in the semester, I met with uh, our junior and senior classes to kind of talk through what did they think was working, what are things that we could improve. Um, and then as we headed into second semester, second quarter, we kind of pressed pause on some of those discussions with a view towards coming back to them in third quarter and really developing um, an updated version of our house system with hopes of launching it either fourth quarter this year or first quarter next year. Really, the, the dream would be to be able to have a upper school retreat at the end of this year, but that will just really be contingent on um, pandemic circumstances and things like that. 
Um, so, so regardless of when the exact launch date is, that's that's still a work in uh, pro process for us as we seek to um, utilize that house system as a way of our our upper school students uh, working with uh, or, or be meeting with and being in community with students outside of just their grade level. And we think the competition and camaraderie that comes out of the house system is one of the things that really makes our upper school experience unique compared to a lot of other uh, contexts. And we think it's a, uh, a lot of fun. So uh, that update is hopefully going to be coming at the end of this year. Uh, we can skip on ahead um, to the next slide. Yep. Advancement and enrollment. Uh, Mr. Buckles already touched on this, so I'm going to be really brief here. Uh, our 2021 fundraising goal, you'll note, note our uh, the school's fiscal year runs from July to June, so July 1st to June 30th. Um, and so the fundraising goal for this fiscal year uh, was $126,000. That fit, that fundraising goal is set to be able to balance the budget. And so when there are fluctuations in enrollment, um, oftentimes what that really means is that that shifts how much we do or don't have to fundraise uh, alongside tuition in order to meet our budget. And so uh, the, that's where this fundraising goal number came from, uh, was a desire to balance our budget. And obviously the incredibly encouraging thing that you'll see is that we have raised over $90,000 in the first uh, four months, uh, really since September um, of this goal. And so uh, a huge chunk of that is March and Serve in the Park. A huge chunk of that is you all and your generosity and your um, uh, buy-in of what is happening at the school. And so we're really deeply encouraged by that. Obviously, the other piece of that has been um, the, the board who has uh, done a bunch of work in terms of developing donor relations and um, pursuing different avenues for fundraising. So we've been really encouraged. We thought that 126 number uh, felt you know, it was it was a, a substantial number, and so to be at the first of the year and at over ninety thousand dollars is uh, incredibly encouraging. Uh, we also talked about enrollment that we've set this goal of one twenty. Uh, it's currently uh, currently as of this semester, we have one hundred and eleven students enrolled for this current spring semester, um, and so this would mark a nine student increase from this semester to next semester. Uh, so we already have 62 students enrolled for next year, which I wanna say that we were at 62 probably sometime March, March or April last year. Um, so that's incredibly encouraging as well. Part of that is obviously we've um, opened enrollment earlier and given an incentive to uh, enroll early. Um, and again, that reminder, January 8th, this Friday is the deadline for that um, early enrollment discount. Uh, of those 62 students, 60 are re-enrollments. We have two new students uh, enrolled for next year. We have a number of interested families that have already contacted us. And so uh, we're, we're optimistic about our ability to meet, meet this uh, 120 goal and then uh, move past it in future years. Uh, so promotion and advertising, uh, just to give you some sense of some things that are um, that we've been doing and are around the around the corner. Really, when we uh, have have done sort of our own research and looking at how do people hear about Providence, there are really two ways that they hear about Providence most commonly. And it's either word of mouth, so that's you talking about where you send your kids to school and why you think it's great, um, and, uh, and Google, right? Those are the, pretty much the two. Uh, they Google a private Christian school, they Google classical Christian school, um, and, uh, and those are the two most common ways that people find us. And so those have been the, the places that we want to focus strategically our advertising and promotion. Uh, so one of the ways we want to encourage more word of mouth uh, um, sort of conveying of, of, of Providence is through yard signs. And you've probably seen like since the pandemic, lots of people have yard signs and uh, about a lot of different things. Um, and obviously went through election year, so there are plenty of yard signs out there about that. Um, but but we wanted to, to give you the opportunity to have a yard sign, if you'd like, uh, in your yard that would just say, hey, we have a student that goes to Providence and we're really proud of them. And if you want to find out more about Providence, we'd be happy to, to let you know. Um, then your neighbors see, hey, you, they know you and they, you know, you know, hopefully have a good relationship with you. And so they um, are curious about what Providence is. Uh, so if you want to go ahead to the next slide, I think there's a picture of the, uh, that yard sign on the next slide. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, 
provide uh, a, one of these yard signs to each family uh, at no cost to you. Um, and they're going to be in production in the next couple of weeks. Our goal is to have them out um, by the second or third week of January to you all. Um, and what we'll probably do is just stack them up by the pickup line and encourage you to uh, toss one in your car at the end of uh, a school day once they're, they're done being produced and uh, encourage you to, to stick it in your front, front yard. Um, and especially at sort of strategic times when families might be thinking about where they're gonna send uh, their students for the coming year. So uh, those, th those times are especially in this sort of late January through March window, and then maybe again in the, those summer months as families are reconsidering their, their school plans for the coming year. Um, and so if you'd like one of those, you'll be uh, welcome to pick one up. If you want to cover the cost of them, you can always make a donation to the school for the $20 that it costs to make them, but that's not required. Our desire is really for you um, to have one if you want one and to, to promote the school um, as much as we can. All right, I wanna move on to the next. Um, so the other things we're doing promotion advertising wise, uh, We've updated the school website. That was the big project this summer. And uh, just to, to, to make sure the information on there was up to date, to give it a whole visual refresh, to make sure it was communicating who we are clearly, especially to prospective families, that it was making the application and enrollment process really clear. Um, and at the same time, in this past year, we've also updated our school brochure. So we've done a lot of work on um, some of those promotional materials that we put in the hands of prospective families to let them know what we're about. Uh, on the back end, we've also done, um, we talked about sort of strategically focusing our promotion and advertising. Uh, we've done that by uh, digital advertising over the course of this past year. Um, we've had a donor who's been willing to underwrite a significant investment in uh, both Facebook and Google ads that have led to increased traffic on our website, uh, increased number of um, interest uh, forms filled out by families. And so when we get those forms, it tells us, hey, how did you find out about us? Well, we found out via, via Google or via Facebook. And, and so um, we think this sort of strategic targeted advertising will be more effective at, uh, at drawing the kind of families that are interested in what it is that, that we have to offer here. Uh, along with that sort of promotion advertising, you know, letting other families know about what's going on at Providence, uh, we're planning on doing grammar and upper school preview nights on February 4th. Um, these are sort of a variation on what we've normally done as an open house. And so the idea will be that uh, the grammar school preview night will not just be pers for prospective families, but actually also for our current pre-K families who want to get a sense of, hey, uh, current pre-K and kindergarten families who want to get a sense of, hey, what's coming up in kindergarten? What's coming up in first grade and into the grammar school? What can we expect? And so you're going to have, you'll, you'll get to hear from Mrs. Dernlin uh, and Mrs. Upton who are going to share uh, about the kindergarten and first grade curriculum and, and share a little bit about what that will look like. So that if you're a parent of a, a pre-K student or a kindergarten student and you're uh, still on the fence or you're thinking about want, just wondering, even if you're already re-enrolled and you just want to know, hey, what is the rest of this grammar school experience going to look like? What's next year going to look like? That evening will be an opportunity for you to get a taste of what's around the corner as well. So we really want to see all of our pre-K and K uh, families there as well. Um, and of course, we'll invite prospective families to come and get a taste as well. Uh, of what's what our grammar school experience looks like. Um, so that's uh, the grammar school preview night. The upper school preview night is going to be similar, and it's actually going to happen on the same night, just with staggered start times. Um, and we'll send more of this information out via the EPAC um, in the coming week. But the upper school preview night will invite all of our current sixth grade families, students, and parents to come to that preview night. They'll have the opportunity to hear from Mr. Buckles and myself about the upper school experience, but also other upper school teachers who will share a little bit about what's to come in upper school. And then again, we'll invite prospective upper school families, families outside of our community who are maybe thinking about sending an upper school, upper school student here for the coming year. So that's what we're calling preview nights. They're not traditional open houses because we really want you all to be there if you're a pre-K, K family, if you're a sixth grade family, if you're a fifth grade parent and you wanna know what is coming in upper school, you're welcome to come. Uh, they really are open invitation, but we are kind of focusing on those transition grades as you look at the rest of the grammar school and then the upper school as well. So those are uh, the preview nights that are coming up. And again, we'll give you more info about that uh, as we go. The last thing I wanted to, to share, Mr. Buckles, was uh, 
the annual report. Um, if you want to jump over to that. So one of the things we wanted to do was hey, say, hey, how can we take what we're doing tonight, distill these updates in a way that is uh, sort of visually friendly and also we can give to people who wouldn't necessarily attend a meeting like this. So grandparents or donors or things like that. And so we've put together an annual report that's just four or five pages long um, that gives you that just sort of hits the highlights. Um, and so I think Mr. Buckles is going to share that on the screen and you'll get a chance to look at it. It's actually also posted in the app. Um, currently in the app, there's a button that says State of the School and that had the link to this Zoom meeting. And it also has a link to this uh, annual report. And so you'll get, you, can, you can obviously pull this up on your own time. We'll, we'll include it in the EPAC on Friday as well. Um, since it looks like it's uh, <laughs> deciding to load a little bit slowly, but... Uh, yeah, so that, I think that was the last thing I was going to note. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think things we can probably just you know, worry about it. And people can, this is, this gives them more. Uh, open up. My computer it could be, I'm just trying to do too many things at once. But, um, yeah. yeah. Why don't we just go ahead and move to, to your closing remarks and QA, and then if it pops up later, yeah. if not, we'll see. We'll send it out. Yeah, I think so. I had clicked on it to uh, load before our presentation tonight, and that tab hadn't loaded either. So I have a feeling w w I won't be able to get it for you. But we will be sharing it, like Mr. Keating said. Uh, it's a it's a great document, and it's it's exciting just to look at highlights of uh, the various encouragements of the past year. And uh, I hope that's what some of this presentation has been too, just to kind of see where we've come in this year. Uh, it's encouraging to look at a year such as 2020 to see that it was not in any ways a stagnant year for the school, but a year where the school continues to advance. And uh, it's been encouraging to see uh, that in the midst of such difficult circumstances, um, one of the, the things that has been of a benefit to Providence is many of, of you who are new families this year perhaps weren't really considering uh, options around or even considering uh, revisiting where you were going to school your children um, and then being prompted to step back and reconsider your options. Uh, we're thankful to hear that many of you have chosen Providence and been very happy that you chose Providence and that we hope to have you guys for many, many years to come. Many of you have already re-enrolled for next year, uh, which is a great encouragement to us. Um, a couple of things I wanna kind of close with. One is I wanna say similar, uh, to Kyle, uh, I really, really appreciate uh, you saying those kind things, Kyle, but I really have to echo also everything that he does. I think a lot of the things that Mr. Keating does for the school go very much unseen. He does a lot of the kinds of tasks and, and behind the scenes things that uh, are hard to see when you're not in your office just next to him. But he just offers so many talents, so many gifts and so much passion for the school and just such support to me. Uh, I mean, so much of what we do is a team effort and I'm really thankful it's in the Lord's providence that he's placed the two of us together because I think our various gifts are very complimentary. He's just so strong in the things that I feel so weak in. And so uh, if you feel that the school is in a healthy place, uh, so much of that has to do equally with everything that Kyle has been doing this past year and for the years leading up to it too. I think you look at examples like the book of prayer that he poured so much into. Uh, but I think, again, one of the things that goes unseen is all of the, uh, you know, there's the technical things that he does with uh, the many things that he's taken care of for us this year. But I think also the shepherding of students, the shepherding of faculty, uh, and seeing that we are ever keeping our vision at the forefront and making sure that we are caring well for those who are under our care. So really thankful for Kyle as well. Um, a, a couple of other short notes. Um, I, I mentioned at various points in the presentation tonight about sort of our long-term goals as a school. Some of you uh, may be somewhat familiar that we have a strategic plan, uh, and I mentioned that the board helps us strategize. And one of the things we actually do every summer is we have a board retreat where the board and the administration meet, and the administration presents to the board a strategic plan. And this strategic plan talks about what our hopes and dreams are for the coming year, what our hopes and dreams are for the coming three to five years, and what our hopes and dreams are for the coming five to 20 years for the school. 
Um, and when we look at those really long-term goals, uh, I mean, some of them, you know, are probably pretty obvious, you know, to see ourselves continue to get to a place of enrollment where we have, um, you know, the kind of resources to fully realize our vision more and more with each day. But I think also uh, we want to see what we're doing here as a school um, contribute to what I would see as the movement of classical Christian education that is really kind of sweeping America. Uh, we've gotten to go the past couple of years to a conference uh, down in Branson, Missouri. And what was interesting to me was to see how many administrators at that conference were part of classical Christian schools that have only just started in the past three to five years or even fewer than three to five years. And we're just booming. Uh, there is this this great uh, hunger for an education like the kind of education that Providence offers. And so I, I think we're doing two things here. On the one hand, we want to continue to give our utmost focus to serving our families in the here and now very well, continuing to be in the present, continuing to see that all that we're doing is serving to achieve that mission and vision that we have as a school. But likewise, uh, we're always looking to the future and continuing to see what opportunities are before us to continue not just growing the school, but growing the school's impact uh, to the city of St. Louis, growing the school's impact to the region of the Midwest, growing the school's impact even on a, on a worldwide scale. Uh, because we believe that an education like the education Providence provides uh, is an education we would love to see everyone have access to who would like to have access to it. Uh, we think cultivating in students a love for what is true, good, and beautiful is central uh, to being human uh, and central to the calling that we have been given to disciple children and to disciple those into uh, Christ and into Christian living. And so we're so thankful that we get to be part of an institution like this. It's exciting uh, to uh, be part of, you know, like what I said, I would call a, a movement in the nation. Uh, but also, I'm very thankful for our small community. I'm thankful that we are a small school. We will ever remain a small school, but I think a small school that we would love to see have a big impact on the generations to come by the students that we educate, uh, but also on other schools and other regions that want to emerge uh, to see what we can do to teach them what we've been able to learn as we've grown and developed as a school. So the last thing I'd want to say is thank you all. Thank you all for your vested interest in this school. Uh, obviously, your tuition dollars go towards that, your fundraising dollars that go above and beyond tuition dollars, but also your prayers. Also, all of the labors that many of you put into the school, whether it's actual kind of physical labors coming in and, and painting or cleaning, uh, all of the other unseen things that many of you do, or just the encouragement that you give the faculty and staff and the administration. You all contribute to this work in more ways than you know. And so we're really thankful for you and thankful to have this opportunity tonight to share some of what's going on at Providence with you and to share our thanks. So uh, with that, uh, I wanted to see if there are any questions. Uh, and so uh, I, I think I would imagine the best way to submit a question would be, uh, well, or let me see here. Best way to submit a question would probably be in the chat. Would, would you say that, Kyle? Uh, I think that's fine. Or if, if someone, if you want to unmute and ask them, yeah. that's fine too. Uh, you know, either way. So feel free to submit a question either of those ways. DVA breaking the ice. <laughs> While we were waiting, I just thought I'd try and load that document again. <clears throat> oh yeah, actually, I think uh, I think I have it up on um, my screen. So let's see if I can. I might might boot you, but mm -hmm. that's all right. So this, yeah, I think it is it sharing now. Uh, so this is uh, this is the annual report. Uh, right picture of some of our kindergartners on the front. 
just got a brief sort of one page year in review uh what, what happened over the course of the year what we thought about all of it and then just some snapshots so enrollment increase um march and serving the park great picture of our fifth graders um how much we awarded as part of the new index tuition program um, and we're excited about how that's making things more accessible to families and then uh pre-k program uh, academic catalog latin a lot of things that you heard tonight but just kind of in the a visual way that we can share with um, others. And you're, of course, free to share it uh, as well with people that you know that might be interested in hearing just an update about how Providence is doing and then kind of looking ahead to 2021 and our enrollment goal, fundraising goal, and some of the things that are coming around the corner. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's the, <clears throat> the sort of visualized version of the annual report. Very good. That's one of those things that Kyle put together and put together very well. Uh, I think even just to say him coming up with that idea is something I never personally would have thought of. And so hopefully that's a good resource to you. And I think as always, like I said earlier, if you're having a, a good experience at Providence, please share the school with other families. I, we, I know I've heard from many of you from yourself that you found out about the school from another family who said, hey, you know, my kids go to this school and they, they shared with you about their good experience and it prompted you to enroll. Um, but on the other hand, if, if you're having a bad experience, if, if there are things that you've been finding concerning or challenging, please reach out to us. Uh, we genuinely wanna make sure that we're serving uh, all of you well. And so as you continue to consider re-enrollment for next year, if you have any hesitations, um, I would love to have a conversation with you and just, just know what those are. And again, see if there are ways that we can answer them and, ways that we can serve you. Even if you're decided you don't want to come back next year, we still have a whole semester left uh, that we would love to, to serve you well in that semester. But uh, we're ever encouraged to see that enrollment is already, like Kyle said, at 62 for next year. Uh, usually tonight would be the kickoff of opening enrollment. So to already have an enrollment of 62 for next year uh, is not just uh, good news by looking at a number, but it's so encouraging to us uh, that mid-year, especially in the middle of this particular school year being as different as it is, uh, that is such a vote of confidence uh, and such a, an encouragement to us as we start to look ahead to next year, make plans and, uh, and get excited about it. This is ever a labor of love uh, on, on our part here. Well, seeing no other questions, uh, and not to ignore your question, Jacob, I'm, <laughs> if you're genuinely curious, that's one of those that I think will involve a little bit more discussion, probably pretty deep philosophical discussion on, well, what is the nature of sickness and uh, what are all of the different, you know, Aristotelian four causes and anyone else out there in the audience, if you want to know about the four causes, you should ask Mr. Dubier about it the next time you see him. Or Ask any students who have been in Mr. Dubier's class, and I bet they could they could really educate you on <laughs> the uh, essential or no no sorry the formal, final, material, and efficient causes of things. So uh, very good. All right. Well, I think I'll close it there. But after tonight, if you have other questions or if this has prompted other thoughts, uh, please reach out to us. This has been recorded, so if you want to go back and look over all of it or parts of it again, you can do that too. Uh, and then the document Kyle just showed is going to highlight similar things. And so you can look over that as well when we send it out in the EPAC this Friday. But uh, I'll go ahead and close this in a brief prayer and then we will say our goodbyes. Heavenly Father, uh, we pray that you would continue to uh, strengthen the school. Lord, fortify us for whatever is ahead. We're thankful for the reminder that you've given us this past year of the humble dependence that we ever need to have on you. Whatever plans we make, whatever we think is before us, uh, Lord, we truly do not know, uh, and you do. We're thankful, Lord, that we have been able to find that rest in you from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. We know what we, that we will find that same rest, that same joy from the beginning of this year to the end of this year, whatever may come to pass. Continue to assure us of the sure foundation that we have in Jesus Christ, Lord, we pray that you would empower the teachers that work with the students each day to build up the students in that same assurance that every student that is at Providence would learn to trust in Jesus Christ as the sure foundation. 
Lord, that they would have such confidence, that they would have such peace, they would have such joy, that they would go on to transform this world in big and small ways. Lord, we're thankful that you call each of us to uh, a specific calling. And Lord, we ask that you would grant us the strength to fulfill that calling. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thanks.